stay hungry, stay foolish. When my dad first introduced me to this quote when I was much younger, I was like, what? I thought Steve Jobs was supposed to be smart. Why would he tell us to do these things that we obviously want to try and avoid? But now looking back, many years later, I think that might have been one of the best pieces of advice that I've ever received. And today, I want to share with you three short stories about how I came to understand this quote, stay hungry, stay foolish, and how I came to realize that maybe Steve Jobs is pretty smart after all. My first story is about math. In junior high, I was invited to the international math competition to represent Canada. And it was a fantastic experience. I got to explore the world and broaden my horizons. But what's more, I had the chance to really better understand myself. Because the issue was that all three years, I never achieved anything higher than a merit, an honor roll award. While at the same time, my friends on the team improved each year, from a merit to a bronze to a silver. So at the end of the three years, I went home and asked myself, why couldn't I do the same? Why wasn't I hungry to strive for that gold medal and do my best to prepare and improve? And now some people might say, oh, it was just a lack of motivation. But for me, that lack of motivation stemmed from a deeper problem, satisfaction. Because I was satisfied with simply being invited onto the team and being able to go and travel around the world. That was enough for me to go home and be able to chat with my friends about what it was like riding an elephant in Thailand. But what it did is it stopped me because I didn't need to try harder, to try and improve, and to set high goals and risk the chance that I might not meet. So in high school, I decided to redeem myself, so to speak. I made it my goal to qualify for the Canadian Mathematical Olympia, the highest level math competition in Canada. And at the start, my journey seemed to be going well. In grade 10, I placed as one of the top contestants in our province, and I was invited to Canada Math Camp for some of the top contestants across Canada. But here's where the problem began. Because once I arrived in Toronto for the camp, I realized that I was suddenly surrounded by people who were so much smarter and more talented than I was. I had no chance of catching up. Whenever the teacher would ask a problem, I would always be the last one to solve it or I might not even be able to solve it at all. And because of this experience, when I went home, I was about ready to give up on that previous dream. But then something happened in grade 11 that made me really question what I enjoyed. Not what my parents expected from me, or what my friends wanted me to do, but what really made me happy. And I realized that solving a math problem, wandering through a dark forest of possible solutions, seeing the light and connecting all of the dots together, that was a thrill that I wasn't ready to give up. And so that summer, after grade 11, I did my best to prepare. And in grade 12, I went into the contest room, ready to face that challenge. And so that year, a week later when the results came out, I found out that the cutoff score was 66, and I had scored 65.5. <laughs> and so here, I was about ready to give up once again. But you see, I had one last chance, a qualifying competition for contestants like me who are just barely off from making it. And so one week later, when I wrote the contest, it was a challenging one. I thought I had no chance of making it to the CMO, and I was ready to dig a little grave for my dreams. But then when the results came out, I found out that I had made it. And so in March this year, I finally had the chance to complete my goal for all three of these years in high school to compete in the Canadian Mathematical Olympiad. But that's not quite the whole story, as some of you math contestants out there might know. Because the CMO itself is only the qualifier for the international level. So here you might be asking, well, why didn't you stay hungry, like you said? Why didn't you try to strive for your place on the national team? Does part of you not regret taking that step and staying hungry? And if I had to honestly answer, it would be yes, of course. But overall, this experience with math was worth it. Because it taught me that sometimes it's important for us to put aside our ego and to stop caring about what other people think about us. And to take that first step and dare to set high goals, even if there's a chance that you might fail. My second story for today is about a frog 
in a well. This frog has lived in this well for his entire life. To him, the entire sky is just this little round circle at the top of the well. That's his entire world. And he's never stepped outside of the well. And to him, he has everything that he needs right here in this little space. And one day, a turtle from the ocean comes over and pokes his head into the well. And so the frog looks out and says, why, hello there, Mr. Turtle. How are you doing today? Would you like to come and take a step into my well? It's truly the most marvelous place. There's enough water to swim in, bugs to eat, sand to relax on. And the turtle goes, well, I'd love to, but I think instead you should come with me and visit the ocean, where the water stretches for miles and miles, and it never dries up or goes away. It's truly the most marvelous place. And the frog hesitates for a long time, because he's lived in this well his entire life, and there's no risk of getting eaten. But if he goes out there, checks out the ocean, suddenly there's a chance that he might take a wrong jump and never come back out. So after a long period of thinking and questioning, he finally decides, why not? I'm going to go ahead and join him. So when this frog takes his first leap outside of the well, he realizes that the sky isn't just a circle. It's an infinite blue expanse. And so for me, in junior high, I was a little bit like that frog in the well. I had great friends, but they were people who didn't really challenge me to achieve and strive for my full potential. So when I came to high school and started getting involved in clubs, hackathons, international activities, I suddenly realized how much I was missing out on because of this egotism that I had, because I was willing and ready not to be foolish and to stand on that pedestal not knowing how much I was missing out on. My third story for today is about fencing. So one year I was fencing at nationals and in my first single elimination round, I was up against a pretty tough opponent. And by the midpoint break, I was pretty far behind. And normally the midpoint break is a fantastic time for you to strategize and think about what points have gone well, what points haven't, and how to improve for the second half of the match. But for me, at that midpoint break, that wasn't what was going through my head. Instead, it was more like this. Crap, 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 crap. I'm losing. What are my parents going to think? All of my teammates are watching. I can't let down my coach. I can't lose this. And so unsurprisingly, once the midpoint break was over and I had headed back to the piece, my attacks became repetitive and uninspired, like an animal trying to claw its way out of a cage. And of course, my opponent scored point after point against me, until the match was over and I was eliminated. And so that day, I went back to our hotel where I was staying with my coach, and he sort of gives me a look, you know, like, come here, we need to have a talk. <laughs> and so as I stood there, cowering in fear, he told me something that stuck with me ever since. He said, Alex, when I saw you fencing out there today, you weren't fencing to win. You were fencing not to lose. And that's when I realized that something had to change because I wasn't fencing to win. I wasn't having fun. I was stressed and frustrated because my points weren't working and I wasn't ready to take risks and score touches that I might otherwise have scored. And that's when I decided, okay, at this next tournament, I'm not gonna care what my parents think about it. Even if my friends watch and record it and put it on YouTube, I'm not gonna care. I'm just gonna go in there, fence, and try and win. And so the next tournament that came up was the Alberta Winter Games of 2020. And so I took a bus with my team all the way up to Wood Buffalo where the competition began. And at the start, it seemed to be going well. I made it through the round robins, through the quarterfinals, through the semifinals, until I was there, standing on the finals for the men's saber event at the Alberta Winter Games. And so I was up against an opponent who I was pretty evenly matched with. And we scored point after point against each other until we were tied at match point, 14-14. And in that very moment, I wasn't going to repeat my past mistake. I wasn't going to let my head be swarmed with thoughts of what if, what if this happened, I can't lose. Instead, I decided to do the most unpredictable thing I could think of. I decided to run up and hit him. And so I did. <laughs> and that was how I won. 
for the first time, a gold medal at the Alberta Winter Games. And so what fencing taught me is that even when the stakes are high, even when it's match point 14-14, sometimes if you don't take that risk, there's no chance you have to succeed. Because even if you choose an action that has a 50% chance of succeeding, and you commit to it 100%, you have a higher chance of succeeding than if you wait, watch for the correct action, but only commit 50%. Because when you commit 50% and the opponent goes 100%, the 100% will win every single time. So I'd like to wrap up my talk today with a quote from Nelson Mandela. He said, may your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. What all of these experiences taught me is that we need to be willing to set aside our fears of failing, of not meeting other people's expectations. Because in the end, if we want to change the world, a necessary first step is to first believe that we can. Thank you.